Good afternoon. So we are the last panel, and we hope we're going to keep it interesting. Unfortunately, we're only left with three uh, panelists, which is going to be great so that we can hopefully be more interactive with the audience. Um, I'd like to invite the panelists onto the stage. We have um, Dr. Lorna Cork from the Industrial Innovation Center, and then we've got James McLeod from Zena, and then we've got Stefano Virgil from uh, Fox Labs. So we hear a lot about innovation. I think it's been a buzzword in the country for about three years. We're gonna take a bit of a twist today and be a bit more realistic about what innovation really is. Um, the theme is obviously cutting edge innovation. So we've got three very diverse personalities on the stage. So we're gonna be covering branding, communication, and industrial innovation. So Dr. Lorna is gonna be on a completely different aspect, which is small and medium industries. And then we've got the gentlemen who are gonna cover the SMEs. Um, just before I ask them to introduce themselves, I just wanted to share some key um, themes that we've been witnessing, obviously around the globe. Uh, with technology and innovation, there's obviously, uh, it's become a borderless society. Um, there are no barriers, there are no challenges. Um, there's a lot of things that have been dissolved for the millennials. And in five years, the majority are going to be millennials. How are we going to accommodate them and their needs? Obviously, ownership doesn't mean anything to them. We've got examples, Airbnb, Facebook doesn't own contact. Uh, content, sorry, um, Airbnb doesn't own properties, uh, Uber does not own any assets, any cars, um, and the younger generation obviously like to spend their money on travel, exploring the world, and obviously exploring their own skills. In Silicon Valley, the majority um, of the developers actually don't, don't even have an education. They have skills. And if they do have an education, it better be a very good education because skills is obviously overtaking and degrees have trumped. So if we go out in the market today and be very obsessed about degrees and whatnot, that's not going to be what the future is looking for. We're looking for people with skills. We're looking for people with continuous learning. I'm gonna keep it short now and move on to the panelists and allow them to have at least 60 seconds each to give a quick intro of themselves. We'll start with you. Okay, my name's uh, Dr. Lorna Cork. I'm an innovation consultant at the Industrial Innovation Center. Um, I've been in Oman for nearly six years now. Um, I started at the IIC when it first opened back in uh, February 2010. Um, I'm actually a researcher, um, so um, I'm here to help industries innovate through new products, processes, and services, and quite often that involves a level of R&D. Um, so my background before that, I was actually a research associate at Nottingham, Nottingham Trent University in the UK. Um, I've also worked in the UK MOD for a couple of years. Uh, my PhD is in biogeochemistry. Um, I've got a master's in ecology and a bachelor's in biology. Very good. Uh, I'm James McLeod, uh, the general manager for Zena PR here in Oman. Um, I'm fortunate to be in Oman three years now. I've been working in the region for 10. I uh, really like working here. Xena PR is part of Xena Group, which is an integrated communications provider. Uh, within my PR team, uh, I have 14 staff, seven of whom are Omani. Uh, and the wider Xena PR uh, group provides uh, branding, advertising, events management, and uh, of course PR. Uh, in New Zealand, which is where I'm from originally, I uh, owned and managed four different businesses of different uh, types uh, over the years, two of which I started from scratch. So I have some sort of experience, some sort of understanding in terms of what it is like to uh, own your own business. So thank you for asking me on the panel today. My name is Stefano Virgili. I'm Italian by birth. Uh, although I look Arabic somehow, so I will get questioned very often uh, whether I'm Arabic or not. But I, was, I was born in Italy, I spent 27 years in Italy. I did my first invoice when I was uh, 16 years old. So it's very interesting that uh, on the panel there is someone that has studied so much and someone that has studied so little. Um, I'm 37 now, so I've uh, been working for 21 years now. I started three businesses in Italy. I started six businesses in Singapore, where I spent six years. And now I've been a man for three years, where I'm running five businesses. 
Um, I do business since uh, my, my parents and my grandparents, and that was always I wanted uh, to do. And I've seen business changing a lot. When I was studying, actually, when I was 14, and I had to choose what to study, I realized that uh, at that point in time, there were no computers, no internet, nothing of what we see now around was available. And uh, I've seen a great transformation. So my class is 1978. If there is any 1978 here, you know what we went through during the uh, growth in the 80s, in the 90s, and then 2000s. So it's very interesting how it's he has developed up to this point. Thank you. Just make sure this one. Everyone can hear me in the back. Can everyone hear me in the back? Okay. Um, before I get started with the gentleman, I'd like Dr. Lorna to tell us a little bit about um, the Industrial Innovative, uh, the IIC okay. Center. I don't think many of you have heard of it. If any has, can you just put your hands up, please? No, no, no one's heard of yeah, okay, um, the Innovation Centre, the Industrial Innovation Centre um, was an initiative that was started between the Research Council and the Public Establishment for Industrial Estates. Um, they actually got together and they, um, in, they surveyed industry um, back in about 2008, 2009 and they said, are you doing innovation? Are you improving your products? Are you improving your processes? Are you improving your services? And industry said no. And they said, well, why not? And they said, well, how do we start? We haven't got any access to the universities. We don't know how to get into the universities. We haven't got the technical people available to us to do it within our, within our company. Uh, we haven't got the finances. It, it's, it's all overwhelming. It's all a bit too much. So the Research Council and PEIE got together and they said, okay, we will provide a program that's going to help all of small to medium-sized industries in Oman. And what we're going to do is we are going to provide uh, technical support and financial support to help a, an industry become innovative. So when we talk about industry, we talk about the manufacturing industries, we're talking about IT, because that's come under as an industry under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. Um, so what we do is uh, myself and the other in innovation consultants will go to a, a factory and work with the people to come up with some ideas. Um, do some brainstorming, what are you doing, how, do, how are you doing it, where do you want to be in five years' time, how can we do this better, what problems, what challenges do you have, um, how can we use innovation to improve this. And once we grasp a good idea of what we're doing, then we um, identify a team of specialists. Now, the specialists can either be um, in Oman, and preferably they are in Oman, or we can use overseas international specialists, and we put together a team of, of industrial research uh, collaboration. Um, and we work together to develop a proposal, and this is a research proposal typically, and we try to address in a very systematic way how we're going to provide a solution to the industrial challenge that, we've, that they're facing. Um, and then the IIC provides uh, funding. It's a government grant. We don't pay for the total cost of the project. We pay for contribution of the, co of the project, and we look for the small to medium-sized industry to also contribute some of the cost as well. Um, and then we actually help mentor and manage the project from initiation all the way through to completion. So the company, at the end of the process, will have an improved manufacturing process, or they'll have a prototype for a new product. Um, and we've been going, yeah, for over five years now, um, and have worked with over 30 companies and over 30 projects. So. Thank you. James. Could you tell us a little bit about how would you define technology and innovation in your specific field? Very often people think that innovation and technology is uh, very specific to an industry. Could you just share something from your perspective and what young Omani entrepreneurs who love PR and that sort of thing, what, how, how could they use technology and innovation? Well, I think, uh, I mean, my, my business is about language and simplifying things as much as possible. So. I really don't like having a whole lot of jargon and, and, and uh, things like that associated with, uh, uh, you know, terms like innovation, that, that, that's all good. But what it really means is that you're changing your business and you're making it better. You're looking at things that you need to improve. You're looking at ways that it makes it easier for customers to give you money. You want to remove roadblocks um, on, that, on that path to your bank account, basically to make your business succeed. Now, obviously, from a, a PR, communications, branding perspective, technology, the impact of that mm. has been huge. Uh, Stefano, you're talking about, um, I'm class of 67, by the way, so I'm a little bit older than you. 
But yeah, the technology, uh, previously you wanted to, to reach out to customers, you had to write a letter, you know, and wait. Hopefully they would respond to you. Now it's instantaneous, you know, we've got the WhatsApp, we've got the Twitter. Um, so it's very empowering uh, to be able to uh, spread your message, your business message, very quickly uh, to your audience. Uh, and it's, it's practically free. Um, so from that perspective, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great enabler. It, it means that your, your uh, communication time frames now are uh, instantaneous, where before they, they, they took an awful long time. The, the, it's a double-edged sword. The, uh, session, certainly the social media uh, not only opens up avenues for you to talk to your audience, but your audience can also talk back to you and uh, give you honest feedback in terms of what they think of your business. Uh, and sometimes your competitors might come in pretending to be customers to complain about your business. So you need to be smart in terms of, yes, you can use this technology in an amazing way, and I'm talking about from a communication mm. standpoint, but you also need to be um, smart in terms of how you manage uh, negative responses uh, and how you conduct a polite conversation. <laughs> A polite conversation as you would with, with someone that you're sharing um, the room with. So if we're talking about 1978 or 1967 or 1907, uh, the, 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 the fundamental thing is actually still the same in, in my regard, is that what is your business? What does it do? Um, why is it different? Uh, why am I listening to you? The, the kind of the core uh, fundamentals of your message to your customers, your potential customers, need to be uh, articulated. You need to know what that is, and then you use this new technology um, to reach the market in a, in a very cost-effective way. And what's your opinion in terms of the maturity level? I mean, we know that there's many platforms, social media, et cetera, mm. that's available, and uh, from an SME perspective, mm. do you think they're harnessing these technologies enough? No. Okay. Uh, just, I mean, obviously there are exceptions and there are some really uh, uh, active promoters mm -hmm. on the medium, uh, but I think uh, Omani businesses, and perhaps it's uh, part of uh, a cultural thing, sometimes they may be a bit shy to promote themselves, uh, a bit shy to have a strong voice uh, in the market. I mean, look, the Omani, everyone wants Omani SMEs to succeed. There's no doubt about that, from His Majesty to everyone in this room here. Uh, and uh, from a media perspective, the media, they love the success stories. They love the, uh, the people who succeed from the small idea and turning it into a business that gives themselves you know, a business to own and operate, perhaps employs other citizens, uh, and that can grow and help to diversify the economy. Uh, and from that perspective, it's... Um, something that needs to be uh, promoted. Uh, the, the business owners need to not be shy in terms of engaging with media. They don't use, have to use a PR company, they just have to know what it is that they're saying um, to the media. Uh, and that awareness uh, can really help uh, benefit their business in a good way. Thank you. Now we move to Virgil. Um, I've read a little bit about you and I've seen that you've got at least 80 certifications. I'm not sure how someone can achieve that in, <laughs> at such a young age. Um, in terms of what you do and that you're globally certified in the Adobe training uh, aspect, what is it that you would like to share? I mean, coming into this country and managing five businesses is quite impressive. What kind of message could you give uh, to the audience in terms of how, how, what have you done from the technology and innovative uh, perspective, and obviously you see a potential in the market, where do you feel Omanis could uh, tap? It's interesting you bring up the Adobe certification. I have the most certified Adobe trainer in the world. I have 83 certifications. It took me about uh, five years to go to get all this certification, and um, um, I decided to uh, teach uh, software, train on software. And um, it's, it was a long process, but I think the story of how I set up the second largest training center in Singapore is quite interesting because I started broke. I had no money at all to invest. Um, so I took it a bite at a time. I went to um, another training center and I asked if I could use, if I could rent one of their desks. And I worked from there for a while. 
and it cost me $200 a month, uh, Singapore dollars, so about 70 real a month. Um, after that, I started having inquiries. I started renting their training room to run my courses in their training room. And uh, when I had enough cash on, uh, on my bank account, I, said, I, I went to take an office that was um, in a good district, but it was probably the worst property in the good district. And I, it, to me, it was important to be in a central area in uh, Novena in Singapore. Um, in that uh, training center, it was funny because it was a training center with no computers. Uh, the moment someone called to sign up for a training, I would have gone and buy a computer, installed the software, and run the course for that person. So literally for every person that signed up, I bought the computer, I set up the computer, I conducted the training. Soon enough, I was, two years later, I was uh, uh, running two training centers in uh, Orchard Road. If you know Singapore, is probably the fanciest uh, street in the country. I had two training centers there. We were running five courses a week. I had 16 employees, 27 associate trainers. I trained 14,000 people in the past uh, 12 years. Um, so it was a very scalable story. I started with non-existing startup capital. I kept my overhead uh, always lower than my, uh, than my income. Uh, so I encouraged to do this type of approach. But I noticed that here in Oman, many young entrepreneurs, first thing they, they do as soon as they have the inception of a business idea in their mind, they go to knock on the door of the bank mm -hmm. or whoever can give them money. And I encourage a lot to start your business with your own resources. Um, and also, uh, many, they start their own business, and the first thing they think of, they get someone to do their marketing in line with what you were saying just now. Where I, where I, was, I think that it's very important that you are the uh, fourth runner for your own business. You start your own business, you put the face for your own business. And I think why many don't do that is because they're afraid of failure. They haven't grasped the concept that in order to gain a major success, you have to first go through some degree of failure. And that's the, that's the feeling that I have here in Oman, that everyone is afraid of failure, uh, mostly because they, they have this idea of reputation being something that you cannot get back once you lose. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you look at most of the success story of those that you have uh, your cell phone in your pocket, you see how they lost their own company when they broke and then they went back to success. And I encourage to really risk in business, uh, not too much, risk wisely, but uh, taking it uh, at small risk at a time so that you can always have a uh, exit strategy. Best uh, decision could be take decision quickly and then adjust your course of direction slowly according to what the market tells you. I just pick up on uh, Stefano's point there. Uh, one thing that uh, I've learned and uh, I, I, I tell my staff, I tell uh, you know, people that I'm working with, you don't le learn anything from succeeding. You only learn uh, when you when you fail, uh, and so there is no shame in, in failing because as long as you only do it once, and then you learn from that and make a new failure in a different direction. But that, as Stefano says, it charts your course, uh, and it's the it's the solid learning that comes as part of being a, a business owner. Yeah. Thank you. I'd like to go back to Dr. Lorna. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about innovation and how it's important to incorporate it into every layer of a business? Okay, a lot of companies that I visit, a lot of companies I speak to use innovation as a buzzword. And we spoke about buzzwords this morning and innovation is the biggest buzzword word at the moment. And you'll say to a company, um, are you innovative? Are you doing innovation? They say, oh yes, of course we are. And then you say, well, how? And that's when people start to stutter and that's when people start to stumble. Um, one of the things that I have noticed is that the executive directors and the management of a company recognize that innovation is important, but that message isn't necessarily channeled down to the employees within a company. Um, there isn't necessarily a process uh, embedded within the company to allow employees of all levels across the, across the company to actually generate ideas and to actually contribute ideas. And there isn't a process in place in the company where those ideas are reviewed and people actually consider the, the value of those ideas. There isn't a person or a group of people in the company who take responsibility of those ideas and actually start to check out the feasibility and can we actually do something with this? Is this going to improve our business? Is this going to take us forward? So actually embedding innovation throughout the, throughout the culture of a company I think is really important. I think the other thing that, that companies struggle is budget. Um, in order to be innovative, if you're going to do something new or if you're going to improve something, then you need to allocate a source of funds. So all of the big companies do. They, they allocate a certain amount of their budget towards R&D. 
And I think that small to medium-sized companies also need to consider allocating a certain amount of their budget to R&D as well. I think that that's very important. There are schemes like our scheme, at the scheme with the Industrial Innovation Assistance Program, where we can also contribute towards that. But I think that it really is re the responsibility of the company to take ownership of that. Um, I also think there's a time uh, problem as well. So I work with factories, and I'll go to a factory, and we'll, you know, you're looking at innovation, encouraging innovation, but their priorities, their core operations, their core manufacturing. Um, and sometimes innovation activities can get put, to the, put behind and set back because of core business. And I think that's, that's where companies can make a mistake because innovation and core business needs to run in parallel mm -hmm. because if you don't keep up with innovation as part of your core business, then your competitor will. And what you don't want to do is invest time and money um, in doing innovation but not enough time and then find that someone else has pipped you to the post. Um, and then the other thing that I think there is a problem um, within SMEs or SMIs is, um, is risk. Um, factories, in order to do innovation, you're going to create something new. It's going to be a new product or an improved process or an improved service. It's going to require some level of budget. It's going to require some level of risk. And as we've already mentioned, there is a huge problem with risk aversion. Um, and now I'm not sure whether that comes down to individuals within a company. They don't want to be responsible for the risk because if there's failure, then perhaps their head is on the chopping block and they're, they're not prepared for that. Or whether it's actually the company as a whole um, doesn't want to lose its market share and so is, is nervous about the risk as well. But I think that until we start to overcome risk, and again, that's one of the things that the Innovation Center offers through our program, we're also providing technical expertise as well as finance and mentoring. So we are trying to actually mitigate risk as part of the proposal planning process. Um, so yeah, those things. <laughs> no, thank you. And I think um, it's interesting how the, the sense of uh, failure is always one of the key factors why uh, many young entrepreneurs actually don't want to go forward with their fantastic ideas in fear of failure. And I think that cultural perspective of uh, you know, reputationally looking around and saying that, oh, he had a try and he, it didn't go through as planned. I know um, a gentleman who actually invented drones 10 years ago. He's Omani. Um, he invented the first, well, I wouldn't say the first solar car, but he did build a solar car and he raced it in, uh, in Australia. Do we know who he is? He's an Omani gentleman. Um, but, you know, I think there is uh, some element of um, one is not wanting to partner with others to grow and that, you know, having that sense of achievement is more important than growing and, uh, you know, having a better future with uh, the ideas and the innovation. And this is where I feel there's a huge divide uh, in the community where you have many who are really great at innovation but don't have the commercial sense or don't even have the communication uh, skills. Now, from your perspective, um, we've seen uh, some organizations trying to do communication. What do you feel they need to work on to, you know? I, I, I'd actually uh, just take you up on your point about this clever chap who in, uh, invented drones and whatnot. Uh, there, there should be a clear distinction made between someone who has a hobby or a passion or whatnot between that and actually owning and running a business. The mm. two quite separate things. You can be the most talented inventor, uh, you know, you can invent some amazing new thing, but you might be totally useless at business. Mm. Um, so unless you find, for instance, a good partner, mm. uh, or unless you totally change your mindset, just because you have, uh, you know, this invention, if you can't take it to market, if you can't manage it in a way that, that people can access it, then it just, remains in your house, you know, it, it, it doesn't go out. So uh, from that perspective, it's, it's important to, because people do talk a lot about passion, mm. you know, Richard Branson, he talked about passion all the time. Um, and a lot of people, you hear, you know, oh, I'm turning, I like jewelry, or I like this, you know, and it is my hobby, and now I'm turning it into a business. The, the discipline involved in terms of running a business, just from my personal experience, um, it's a whole different thing from making jewellery. You know, you have to be good at jewellery, but you also have to be a really good business owner also. Uh, so when people get into that situation where they all, all of a sudden own a business, 
They need to uh, approach it as, you know, it's a, it's a discipline, it's a job title. Uh, it's not just about being creative and all of those types of things. From the, from the, um, the communication, the branding perspective, obviously once you open your door, once you try to uh, introduce the world to your business, uh, that's where a company like mine, uh, ours, comes in. Uh, and a lot of people think that branding is about a nice logo. You know, it's like we, we need to spend a lot of time designing a, a, a cool looking logo and they agonize over the colors and the font and all of those types of things. The logo is, I mean, it's part of your company. It's on your business card. It's on your website. It's on all of, uh, you know, the materials that represent your company. But underneath that, you need to have the story. What is your company about? Uh, and as Stefano said, uh, be proud as the, as the owner and originator of your company. Don't try and you know, hide behind the logo too much. Certainly in the early days, when you try and sell it perhaps, then you can hide behind the logo a bit more. Uh, so the, the, the branding is, is like the, the clothes that you wear, but it's not you, okay? You are the business. Uh, so uh, kind of crystallizing that into a messaging framework that you can apply visually, that you can apply in all of your press materials, in, uh, you know, online on websites, uh, bits and pieces like that, so that whether you're talking to someone in the elevator or if someone's going online to see your business, the, the key themes of your business remain the same that you're communicating to the market. So understanding what it is that your business is and what makes it different and what makes it appealing and why should I remember this, they are the kind of the important things to remember. Once you've got that, you've got that down, then you, uh, you use those foundation messages in all of the different touch points that you have with, with customers, okay? Thank you. We're hearing a lot about disruption, and disruption obviously is not in one specific industry. Very soon, all industries are gonna be disrupted. From that perspective, I would like you to, you know, to shed some light uh, with us. You know, we're talking about wearables, Internet of Things, 3D printing, cheaper, lighter, et cetera. Um, even from a training perspective, what we used to do, we know we can't do anymore. There's e-learning platforms, etc. Actually, has a higher rate of return and impact on uh, on individuals than sitting on a workshop for three or four days. So, from that perspective, you being a trainer, how are you prepared, or how do you advise others to be prepared from a disruptive uh, perspective? It might come in here, maybe five years later, but we have to be ready for it. Thank you for the question. Actually, tomorrow I will be one of the speakers at EduTrack, and I will be talking about education, not being educated. Uh, one of the things that I would say is that what they teach now currently at the university about uh, how you make success a story for business, some of the things that you learn are not uh, recognizable in real life. For example, you go to school, they tell you your logo has to have a meaning, and then you buy a phone from a website called apple.com. You don't buy fruit from there. So it has no meaning at all, and you buy technology. Second thing they tell you is you have to have uh, social media. You have to have your Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and all that, all that you can. And Apple doesn't have neither of them. So they don't have meaning with their logo. They don't have social media, and yet you have one in your pocket. And it's the least innovative company of the past seven years. They haven't changed the user interface in seven years. So they don't do innovation, they don't do social media, their logo it doesn't have any meaning at all, but yet we keep teaching, have a meaning, have social media, do innovation. So bottom line is, what really works? I know of a gentleman in Italy, he retired in his 60s, millionaire. He said, I want to buy a new business and have fun. He bought a nails factory, nails. He innovated the processes inside. He didn't make nails with QR code in it or RFID. It just make new processes, how we make bills faster, how we account HR faster, and it make the company more successful. For my example, when I started implementing innovation, I implemented Google Apps in 2007. The reason why I stopped printing uh, invoices in 2007, eight years ago I stopped printing invoices, it wasn't because I wanted to innovate for whatever reason to innovate the industry, it's because it was too expensive. Why we implemented Slack, which is perhaps the most user-friendly platform that you can involve your team with currently in the world. Why we implemented it? Because 
some of my team one day might not show up at work. Or one day we are in office and internet is gone. So everyone home, but I have to keep in touch with them. If you think of the corporate uh, environment, we all jam to go in the same building in the morning, and then the person that is in the next office, you send them an email or a memo to remind them about the meeting that you will have tomorrow. So can't, they, can't you do that from home or in another uh, context? So the, the innovation comes from the solution, in my opinion, in the service industry, comes from the solution that you can uh, uh, implement to cut the cost. So when we talk about uh, uh, products, of course, there are these uh, wearables that two years ago were the in thing. Now you can find them cheap, cheap, cheap from China, and you can't tell the difference among them anymore. That's where branding makes a huge difference. So there are inventors that come up with great ideas, but they are not able to bring it to the market. There are companies like Apple that have, there is not a fantastic phone. If you have tried other phones before, you know, it's just comparable. They have a great camera, of course. It's a comparable type of hardware, but marketed in a way where branding is never what you see or what you hear or what you touch. Branding is the way you feel. So if you say, after I take a picture with my iPhone 6, I feel like a great photographer, that's the branding. But the, the Apple is not the branding of uh, Apple. It's maybe for the fruit market, but not for Apple. Thank you. Now we'll move to um, Dr. Lona again. Uh, could you just give us an example or of a company or two that have benefited from uh, the programs that uh, IIC has organized? Okay, one of the companies um, I've been working with for a couple of years now, um, they are a small company and they were responsible for cutting marble and granite slabs um, based in Oman. And the problem that they had was that the cost of, they had lots of offcuts that they were producing and they were accumulating around the factory floor and it was unsightly, um, it was messy, it was a bit of a health hazard, a trip hazard. Um, but in order to remove them, they had to pay to get them disposed of. They had to be disposed of in landfill. So that was environmentally damaging because this stuff doesn't degrade very easily um, or at all. So there was a huge cost associated with a core part of the manufacturing process. So what we did was we actually started to work quite closely. We got a team of industrial engineers together. Um, we worked very closely with the company to try and come up with um, a machine that was very, very small, because this is only a small company. So you can't start having these huge kind of um, big crushing machines that you usually see in, in typical large quarries. That wouldn't work, because it's a small company. So we actually came up with a small portable crushing grinding machine so that we can actually take these offcuts, we can transform them into the machine, um, and the output was, in, it was twofold. You could either have small pebbles or you could have the powder. Now, the pebbles can then be used by local artisans in the, in the um, handicraft industry. It can be used as decor for, um, for grass um, when you're doing your garden, your landscaping. So there were quite a few uses for the pebbles. You could also um, use the, the powder that came out of the machine. That can be used in jewelry. Uh, it can also be used to reinforce cement. And so all of a sudden, this stuff that was causing a huge um, hazard um, er, then it was accumulating around the factory floor could then be transformed into something that they could actually make profit from. On top of that, they then had the decision, what do we do with the machine? Um, and they're still making the decision at the moment. Do they want to actually expand their business so that they start manufacturing machines? Or do they want to do a joint partner with another uh, partnership with another company that does manufacture machines, so they come up with some kind of profit share agreement? Or do they want to kind of come up with some spin-off company that can actually take it forward as well? So one innovation project managed to remove all the waste around the factory. It, um, it was able to improve um, an environmental hazard that was happening in Oman. Um, it's able to give them a new source of profit because they're turning waste into something that's now profitable. Um, it's able to come up with a machine. Uh, we've registered for the patent. We're still waiting to confirm, but we think it's patentable. So they'll hold the intellectual property for that machine. And then they have the opportunity to spin off businesses or to come up with joint ventures. And that was just one project. I mean, I'd like to know, in your opinion, I mean, we're talking about the collaborative economy, the sharing economy, et cetera. How do you feel the market in Oman is in terms of collaboration? Do you think they collaborate enough? I mean, obviously, 
one company can do everything, but if you have 10 of them and they collaborate, they can actually complement each other. Do you see a trend or do you feel that they, you know, there's, there's room for improvement from that perspective? I think there's room for improvement. Um, I think that there's a certain amount of kind of privacy. This is our stuff, where do you want to know? Um, mm. And perhaps people are a little bit worried that other companies may take their ideas or, you know. So I think in terms of co collaboration amongst companies, uh, there, is, there is room for improvement. Mm. Um, but when it comes to, you know, doing collaboration with researchers, I th we have non-disclosure agreements and confidentiality agreements that are put in place. And perhaps if that line was for, put forward with other companies, then that could be easily overcome. Mm. It's just having the right kind of legal guidance as to how to protect yourself, but actually do a collaboration so that it's a win-win. Mm. Um, and perhaps that's where guidance is needed to give people the confidence to take that step. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move uh, on to James. Um, I'd like to spend some time, obviously, with the audience, since it's our last session. But any final remarks? I mean, obviously, the three of you um, are coming from very different uh, aspects, but obviously, it would complement each other from the industrial perspective, the branding and communication, mobile, et cetera. How do you think these different aspects can work together to give hope for the younger generation? We're talking about innovation. Right. Um, I think you could break it down into some you know, uh, really simple terms. Let's talk about quality. Let's talk about um, <coughs> service, attention to service, attention to satisfying clients' needs. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about communication or branding or anything like that. I'm just talking about delivering good service, a good product, uh, and <coughs> making your cl uh, customers happy, making them want to come back to you again. Personally, uh, and in the business situation, I've had uh, interactions with a number of smaller businesses in Oman where maybe they're so busy, but they, they don't seem to you know, want the business or something. And th that, that is money or revenue that is just not, not being collected. Mm. Um, now, if that uh, transaction was completed, perhaps next time I would go for a bigger order, a bigger order, uh, and their business would grow. Um, just the simple things, you know, just uh, paying a, a close attention to customer service, making sure that your, your customers are happy. Um, look, you can spend a million reals on advertising, on branding, on PR, but if you have one dissatisfied customer, that customer will tell their friends and so on and so forth, uh, and it is much harder to uh, win back a good reputation than it is to work very hard to keep it in the first place. Um, now we all make mistakes and there are, you know, there are all learnings in terms of our interactions, uh, but uh, just sticking to the basics and making sure that they are uh, done to the best of your abilities, look at what your competitors do. How are they delivering service? How can you make a better impact on the customer experience than what they're currently getting? You want to make it as easy as possible for people to deal with you, and they, they, they should want to be able to deal with you. Um, and just touching on my point previously, uh, the media here, uh, they love the success story of the, of the Mani entrepreneurs, you know? Um, there, are, there are good ones in the market, we need more. And I'm sure that they're there, but people perhaps are shy, you know, they don't want to um, you know, open their doors and, and uh, tell their story, uh, but that's the first um, first step to you know embracing the, the the bigger business opportunities. And I'll tell you, if you go out there uh, and tell your story, introduce yourself, you're not going to have any problems with funding. You're not going to have any problems with banks. Um, if you inspire people with your story, with your message, people people will want to join hands with you. I guarantee it. Um, yeah. No, thank you. I mean, it's very clear that even in terms of customer, we don't even call it customer service anymore. It's actually customer engagement and enrichment. And this is um, one area that's missing. And there is many innovative ways of doing that. Um, a very small example, um, we tried to get a loan one time from a bank. And um, obviously, we, we do consulting with them. But we're not the biggest consulting firm uh, in Oman. And I think they accidentally uh, send me the thread of email and they said, can you treat them as an exception because we're going to be doing business with them. 
So it wasn't about my financial statements. It wasn't about anything else. So it was, you know, it was nice to see that because obviously they want to maintain engagement. They saw me as a client just as much as I saw them as my client. And, you know, we, we closed something that's a win-win for both. And I think we're sort of missing that point. Um, same thing with marketing. We used to spend tons of money on marketing. Um, our budget has been slashed by almost 80% because we have our customers speaking for us. Yeah, and we can see that even with um, other organizations, I follow Twitter a lot, and I've seen a lot of customers, whether they're complaining or they're complimenting, I see these organizations are not even retweeting, or at least responding to the issues of quality, and not even retweeting the good stuff that is said by uh, customers. So I think even you know, when we talk about innovation, it doesn't have to be something explosive. But what are we doing? And are we constantly trying to learn? And are we curious? And do we have a sense of purpose? Are we human? Are we human enough to connect with people? Because with more technology, obviously, you need to be more human as well to connect with your um, customers and stakeholders. Do you mind if I check uh, with the audience how many are students? How many are currently students? Ooh. How many have watched the video, uh, the Stanford University speech by Steve Jobs? How many have watched it? Mm -hmm. See, um, one thing is quite interesting about this piece. Steve Jobs, in the end, it says, stay hungry, stay foolish. And I kind of question that. I mean, I'm in no position to question what Steve Jobs has done. But if you stick to that one, if you stick to the fact of being hungry and foolish all the time, you'll never be contented, and you will never be in, uh, calculative. And in business, you've got to be calculative. At some point, you have to calculate what is, what is the right uh, stuff to do. So if you stay hungry and stay foolish, you will go through. Uh, certain failure, you will go through possible success. My uh, suggestion is don't, don't take that speech like you live your whole life like that speech. The speech is meant to motivate you when you are in certain circumstances, not throughout the, the entire business life that you're going to face. Um, in the end, what, what will make a, a major change is, what, is one idea that you have and you're able to bring it all the way to the end. If you think of it, when uh, Bill Gates decided to put icons uh, in the operating system, it was just a, a kid. And how many engineers were operating in that industry at that point in time? How many millions of engineers had the opportunity to transform the strings of DOS into icons and they didn't do it? So it's just one single idea that have been implemented from the commercial point of view perfectly. Single idea, perfectly executed commercially. So the logic is, yes, stay hungry and foolish until the inception part, let your heart Define where you want to go, but let your brain calculate how to get there. And very often, you have to be able to move very quickly, see where the market is moving and go to that, uh, towards that direction. Um, for, if I can leave one last uh, remark for a young uh, Oman, some of them actually, some of the people in the audience, they came to my organization to ask for uh, guidance for the SMEs. And I will repeat always the same, uh, the same story, which is uh, make sure that you uh, keep your capital low, your overhead low, your business is scalable as much as you want, and you are in an industry where people want and need your service. Um, too many times I meet a young entrepreneur and I ask them, what do you do? And their explanation of the business that they are starting takes more than two minutes. And I don't understand what they're doing. I mean, if you, if you ask, you say, what McDonald's does? Hamburger. It's very simple. And can you change the rest? Do they innovate? No, they don't. It's just hamburger for God knows how many years. So the same logic. You, you have a great idea. It's simple to deliver. Sticks to the four, these four parameters. And don't change. Just, care, just carry on doing what you are doing and doing it the best that you can. And Dr. Lorna, I mean, the industrial obviously is, a, is another area where people step back and you know, get uncomfortable and think that, no, that's going to take a long time, or it's, it's a huge investment, et cetera. What, what would be your key takeaways or to encourage young entrepreneurs? I think the key is that you have to innovate. Actually, there's no choice, really, in today's society. All of the companies are innovating. Um, so many companies are quite comfortable sitting in the status quo, but their neighbors in the GCC are innovating. Their neighbors in Europe are innovating. Their neighbors in America are innovating. So to kind of sit there and have a little kind of cloud around you and think, well, we're fine, we don't need to, I think that's a mistake. 
Um, I think that there, you know, there is a government program out there. There is government support. There is our Industrial Innovation Center. If you're an individual and you want to start up or you're an inventor and you want to do something, the Research Council also have a host of other innovation programs under the iHub. Um, they have an individual um, innovation program. There's a community innovation program. Um, the universities are now encouraging uh, students to do innovation. I know SQU are very keen on encouraging their engineering students to do patent searches when they're coming up with their project ideas for the final year students in the engineering school and in the other schools. You know, when you're coming up with your research project, do, do a patent search. What else is out there? How can you do yours different? Um, Caledonia College of Engineering have got a, a center for innovation and creativity. So High University. I mean, a lot of the organizations now, the educational organizations, as well as governmental organizations, um, ITA also have an innovation center for their incubators. So I think that there is a lot of stuff out there. Um, perhaps we could be better at advertising what we do. And, and when we started this, no one really knew who the innovation center was. So that's something that we need to work on, actually, to promote our industrial innovation assistance program. And I know that there, is, there are plans underway to do that over the next few months. Um, but I think you know, it's utilizing the resources that are available um, and actually using those in, to your best interest when you're in industry and you're trying to innovate, or even as an in individual. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? For anyone? Okay, we've got two. Uh, my question is to the doctor here. I mean, innovation is like, wide world, everybody is now talking about innovation, and it is even there is a master in innovation. To be innovative, I mean, it's, it is not in everything, right? And not everyone could be. So when you go, like you said, you go to a factory, and you start talking to people, obviously people should understand uh, their capability, their potentials. So how you encourage people to discover their potentials in okay. order to be innovative. Okay, well, innovation is a process. So every, there are lots of different aspects to the process. So you've got your idea creation and your ideation process. You've got your teams of people that are looking at those ideas and trying to work out you know, which ones are best. Now, in order to be innovative, it means you need to improve something or you can do something better. Well, we can all improve. There's nobody in this room that's perfect. That there is no business that is perfect. So there is always room for improvement. So the key to identifying the challenge is to kind of really work with each other. And there are lots of different ways where you can do brainstorming. You can get people to think about the challenges. You can look at people um, and innovation from the operations side. You can look at it from your customer side. Have you got customer complaints? You can look at it from your competitor's side. You know, what are they doing that you're not doing? And should you be changing your business model to do what you're doing better? Um, you can look at the number of orders that you're getting. You know, are you able to meet your demand? You know, if you're getting 1,000 orders a month and you're only able to make 500 pieces of whatever it is you make, then you're not able to keep up with your demand. So there are lots of different ways where innovation can be applied to a business. And really, it's getting the right teams of people together to analyze the business in segments and in sections and actually um, work out the best way to innovate the certain section within that company. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this uh, very fruitful discussion. Actually, I have uh, two, two, two points here. First of all, of course, there are a, a very big efforts for introducing the innovation and building the culture of innovation in the, uh, with the students, even within lower classes, uh, colleagues, universities. Uh, the challenge here, you know, how to protect the right of these young students and keep this somewhere, you know, for themselves instead, you know, being taken by, by other people. This is one. Secondly, uh, even we are in our program for developing uh, uh, Omani entrepreneurs, actually we come across some people who really have a very good idea. 
they are innovators. However, when we want to convert this idea into, an, I mean, into business idea, there is the big challenge, actually. It took us a very long time, and sometimes it has really not come as a result. Now, what's the best way to take this idea from a good idea into a good business viable idea? Is by selling this idea for some, to somebody else or to have a partner? Or what, what's your suggestion to, to come uh, you know, ahead from, from here? Thank you. Well, just to pick up on uh, uh, the, the, Apple, yeah, the, the Apple story before, uh, it wasn't just Steve Jobs. It was um, Steve Wozniak as well. And if you actually you know, know the history of the Apple computer back when their logo was really terrible, uh, Steve Wozniak was the real uh, technological genius behind the Apple computer. He, could, he had a vision in his mind where he could make a personal computer for a, a, an achievable price. He could, he could do the technology, the software, but he wasn't a business guy. He wasn't a, uh, uh, you know, he, he couldn't do the deals. Uh, from that perspective, and for, for, from what I know, Steve Jobs was that guy. Uh, later on, he, he, he became quite visionary in terms of what could be achieved with technology, but it was to start, Apple Computer was two sides of the coin. You know, you had uh, uh, Wozniak, who was the um, technological genius, for the want of a better word, and Steve, who was the salesman, he was the business guy. Um, so I think. Yes, if we're, if we're taking the example of the, the, the invention, yes, you could sell it if, if, if there was a, you know, a ready market for it. But to plant the seed and to, to, to see how far it could go, if, if that inventor, if that technological genius doesn't have the business nous, the business skills, then he or she needs a partner. Uh, and, uh, and there's probably lots of examples like that uh, here in Oman and, and around the world. I was invited as a speaker in uh, Slovenia last uh, April. There was Podium, the 35th edition, and I was speaking in front of an audience of 500 uh, startup owners in uh, Europe. Uh, there were some guests also, some of the speakers from the United States. It's interesting how they see the world. They kept saying, the technology is in Europe, the money is in the US, and the people is in Asia, which means that the Middle East is nowhere on their radar. But my logic is, if you find here a need for technology, you can develop it in Europe, you don't need the capital from the US, just sell the idea here. Or use clients to do the innovation because they need the innovation. So also connected to what the gentleman just now was asking, what is innovation? Uh, in my opinion, and also connected to what uh, uh, Dr. Lorna was saying, it doesn't mean that if your company is not innovative, it means that it's sitting back and waiting for the <coughs> opportunities to fall on them. It means that if you are in, not innovative, it's because you don't need to be innovative right now. But if you are, if you are thinking of how to address issues, like I was a, at that conference in, in two days in Slovenia, I came up with so many ideas, it was amazing. There was this guy that approached me in his 20s. He says, so in Oman you don't have, uh, you, you have water tank on top of the house, right? I said, yes, we have a water tank. He asked me, how, how do you know how much water is in the tank? I said, I don't know. So he said, we've got this idea, it's a bowl, you throw it into the water tank, it connects to your cell phone, it calculates how much pressure on top, how much pressure below, and it tells you how much water you have in the tank. Cool, come and build it. So who do you sell it to? In a case like this, I wouldn't go, if I have an idea like this, I wouldn't go for a partner, I would go for a client, because the client will pay for the development. And then from the development, you, you scale it. What other countries, they have the water tank? Here, here's the ball. <laughs> and keep selling it. So not necessarily you need a partner. Again, even yesterday night, I was having a, a business meeting. The logic is always the same. I want to start a market. I see an opportunity. Now I'm very interested in East Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, and uh, Uganda. I want to do business there. So of course I will look into who is interested in doing business there. I find someone is interested in doing business. It doesn't mean that if they have the money, are the ideal partner. Maybe they are not. So if I can do it myself, I do it myself. As much as I can, I retain the ownership of the business. But then if it's too big, it's way too big, then we'll have to invest, uh, get someone to invest in the, in the project. Oh, I'm supposed to say something. <laughs> Usually moderators are not supposed to answer this question or any questions, but um, I'd like to speak from an Omani perspective. Um, 
Usually there are many great ideas floating around, but they don't know how to conceptualize it. That's one issue. Um, other times they can conceptualize it, but obviously uh, they don't have the courage um, to take that risk and own up the, the idea of you know, conceptualizing it and making it happen. Um, other times, obviously, like we've talked about, I mean, there are, there are many who are great inventors but are not good business people, but they're not prepared to go into partnership because it's something to do with the ego and wanting to have that sense of achievement and all the spotlight on them. And they've actually, they've actually destroyed themselves in many ways because I know some of them. Um, but I think at the, at the end of the day, I think we need to understand that innovation is there and technology is there to help us save, to help us grow, and to help us move forward. It's not an expensive investment as many think. I mean, we run a consulting firm, and I was just having a conversation with my team that we'll run out of business. Nobody's going to need consulting. Just like, you know, we had accountants. 20, 30 years ago, today you have an ERP. You don't need to be a chartered accountant. You don't even need an accountant in the office. Everything gets processed through an ERP. Same thing with recruitment. There's many things that we have to do, and we are doing it actually in Oman. I'm hiring programmers. I'm hiring developers and coders. Obviously, everyone's asking me that you're in the consulting field, business consulting, why do you need that? I said, well, I need to find a way to offer my services uh, cheaper, faster, uh, Etc. Right. So I think we just have to change our mindset and not underestimate ourselves. And the most amazing thing is I asked my niece, who's eight years old, and I think with age you develop this fear of not wanting to think innovatively. And I told her, I told her, you know what STEM is? She's like, just give me a minute. She googled, and she said it's science, technology, engineering, and math. I said, so what does that mean? She's like, it's easy, you know. And so I told her, okay, think about that. And tell me, what would you come up with if you studied, you know, you had a good education in STEM? So she's like, give me a day. So the next morning she woke up and she told me, she's like, I've got a great idea. I said, what? She's like, we need to create an app that does not frustrate kids. And I said, what do you mean? She's like, an app that does not require us to be online when we want to move on to the next levels of the game, right? That we can be offline and still play. I said, okay, <laughs> thanks. So what I'm saying is that there is, you know, I think that that level of courage to just jump out and think out loud and then test it and conceptualize it to its uh, reality is something that we need to think about. Thank you.